Hello, and welcome to this latest episode of the Friends of Sanctuary podcast. I'm Marianne Bartels, Chief Investment Strategist at Sanctuary Wealth. Today, I'm pleased to welcome our guests, Fran Byers, Managing Director and Head of Capital Markets at Cliffwater, and Patrick McGowan, Managing Director and Head of Manager Research and Alternative Investments at Sanctuary Wealth. Welcome, Fran, and welcome, Patrick. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you for joining. So we're going to talk about the private markets today, particularly the credit markets. And Patrick, I want to start off with you. Let's let's kind of do like a big picture. I always like do big picture, big macro. Let's set the stage of what the private markets look like today compared to history. When I first came in the business, no one that I knew of invested in private markets. It wasn't even part of our asset allocation alternatives were, you know, gold, pretty much. Um, And today we have a very uh, vibrant private markets. And today we're going to talk about credit markets. Can you tell us a little bit of a history about the uh, credit markets and where we stand today? Yeah, absolutely. Well, currently, we've seen a major um, retrenchment of banks from regulatory perspective and for a variety of other reasons um, in lending, particularly to middle market companies. And private credit lenders have come in to, to fill that void. And that happened after the great financial crisis. Correct. When, when credit really dried up. That's correct. There's been a series of, of, of regulatory reasons that have certainly um, accelerated that process and the great financial uh, crisis, Dodd-Frank, and then also we're seeing in Europe with regulatory um, uh, regime over there, particularly with like Basel III and other um, other things that are re- where it's more challenging for banks where they can't make loans that they used to make. And it's created a really interesting environment for private credit because, um, because currently we're in the longest inverted yield curve that the U.S. has experienced since the record was set in 1978. That's a pretty long time. Yeah. And meanwhile, we have seen a lot of money flow into private credit. But at the same time, we've seen a major expansion from the year around 2000 to today of overall public and private debt um, of about 4x growth. And so we're seeing debt overall expanding and private credit is not just disintermediating the banks, but it's also part of the overall expansion of credit markets today. Um, And with that, we're seeing new entrants come into this space, but also new vehicles that they've created. They call this the democratization of alternatives, making what used to only be available to institutional level clients to the retail investor, correct? Correct, in a lot of ways. And the, the vehicles that have allowed for um, private credit to expand were certainly uh, the BDC, the business development company, which was part of a regulatory process where the BDC was created to allow for more lending to middle market companies via non-bank lenders. Can you define a BDC, what that means for some yeah. of the audience that may not know what that means? Yeah, absolutely. So it's a, it's a legal structure. It's an entity that's created that essentially a certain percentage of the fu- of a BDC has to be used for lending to U.S. middle market companies. And it allows investors to, um, to put money into the vehicle. And that vehicle also has its own regula- has its own um, restrictions around leverage. Also, as I mentioned, the types of loans it can make. And it allows for uh, companies to, you know, to to lend from an entity where normally a bank may say, we cannot lend to you. They may be able to go to a BDC um, and and borrow money. And BDCs um, are not the only type of structure that has come into the space as well. um, The BDCs were then, the original BDCs were uh, private and potentially had finite terms. And recently they've really morphed into 
what we're seeing today is the evergreen BDC. So the BDC that continually is open for fundraising is continually deploying capital. And it's also been met with other funds like interval funds, which have been, um, that have the same idea where they're, they're evergreen in nature as well. And those also have their own uh, limitations around leverage and amount of uh, what, what they can do in terms of the types of investments that they can make. And can you explain evergreen? Big, we were talking about this earlier. It's it's you, you said they're very similar to like a mutual fund or an ETF, but yeah. we use this term evergreen. Yeah. So the term evergreen is is a is a term that really is really put on the against the private markets because in the public markets we've always had evergreen funds. Mutual funds are evergreen. ETFs are evergreen. Anything that we've used in traditional markets are evergreen funds, but private market funds have historically been closed-ended or have a finite term. So they have either anywhere from five to 10 years of length. What's changed is that those private market vehicles are simply becoming more like our mutual fund um, funds, which are evergreen in nature. We just don't refer to mutual funds as evergreen. They just have always been. So the BDCs and the interval funds, as well as several other types of funds are evergreen. And I'll say that Last point is that because in private credit, in the market that we're in today, yields are around 11% and defaults have been historically low. And with the advent of the evergreen funds, investors have been, um, have been very interested in investing into private credit and having that democratization as you Especially mentioned. Especially when we're at zero interest rates. Correct. So, Fran, even the Federal Reserve has woken up to the private markets. They've been writing about you now. And what really shocked me, what came out of the San Francisco Fed, is that, you know, the title is, is that private markets perform better than public markets. I never thought I would see a headline like that. Um, and I think that's going to draw a lot of attention um, to, to your space. So the credit markets have done phenomenally well, as Patrick has laid out. Uh, you and your firm are experts in the credit markets. One of the things that made you very successful was your Cliff Water Direct Lending Index. Can you explain to our audience again, because we spoke back in October, uh, but just for anybody that didn't see that episode, can you explain what this index is? Yeah. So um, just a quick word about Cliff Water. We were founded over 20 years ago as an alternatives advisory shop, basically helping large institutional investors such as pension funds, endowments, select alternative investments within hedge funds, private equity, private debt. Um, we saw very early on that where the interest rate environment was going, that traditional investments really weren't going to be enough for the yield return that a lot of these pension funds were looking for. Coming out of Dodd-Frank, Private debt became very, very interesting to Cliffwater as a potential allocation to large investors. Prior to the GFC, it was a very small, lesser known asset class. But we really started to see the benefits of direct lending, the contractual coupons, the outsized return premium. But our founder, Steve Nesbitt, always says it's really hard to get investors to come into an asset class in a really big way without some level of benchmark or index to basically track performance against. And there was no index for direct lending coming out of the GFC. And so Steve actually went out and he built the Cliffwater Direct Lending Index. It is now the gold standard in the market. A lot of different managers are using it. A lot of pension funds are benchmarking their returns to it. And basically what the index is, it does track BDCs and we go through their public filings and we track all the loans and they roll up into a total return metric, and we're also tracking losses. But what's been really impactful about the indexes, and it goes back 20 years, it shows the reliability and the predictability of the returns within direct lending. It shows that you're generally you know, earning outsized yield premiums. It consistently performs better than public markets, and it really allows us to quantify losses. That's the important piece because for investors to come into this asset class, they want to know what's my downsize risk what is the loss rate within direct lending? And we were able to find that, you know, in up cycles, default rates and, and losses are very, very low, minor. Sometimes direct lenders are having gains. 
And in bad markets like recessions, we can see the loss rate really spike. On average, it's around 100 basis points a year over the 20 year period. Um, but for the most Which is part, not a lot. That's 1%. Yeah, it's not a lot. I mean, when we go into downturns like the GFC, the loss rate definitely spiked and it was much more during COVID. It was much more. But what's really impactful is because the yield within direct lending is so attractive and these um, loans are throwing off typically high single digit, right now low double digit, um, those yields are typically more than what you're going to have in terms of losses. So you very rarely have a down year in direct lending. So when you're sitting down with a potential client, let's say this in this case, a retail client, um, what are the pros that you give to them um, so they can understand how um, the credit part of the private market can function in their portfolio? What are some of the arguments to, to allocate to the private credit market? Yeah. So if investors are willing to give up a very small amount of liquidity in a you know modest sized part of their portfolio. If they're willing to give up some of that liquidity, because um, they can't like, easily buy and sell right. once they so, invest. You know, we tell our investors this isn't a short term trade. Direct lending is a long term allocation in your portfolio. You're really wanting to come in and put your money into this asset class and watch it grow, compounded annual returns over three, five, seven year period. That's where you really start to get the benefits of direct lending. And what we tell our investors who are very reliant on 60-40 portfolios, if you can just allocate a modest portion of your portfolio away from these more volatile um, asset classes into alternatives and particularly private credit, you can do three things. First, you can lower the volatility in your portfolio and you can mitigate some of your downside risks because these assets don't trade down as drastically as you would see in the equities or the bond market. The second thing you're going to do is you're going to increase the reliability of your return stream because direct lending returns, they're very predictable and they're very consistent through different cycles. And then the last thing you're going to do is you can earn an outsized yield premium. So private assets and particularly direct lending does earn a illiquidity premium over public markets. So if we look at direct lending, it generally receives a 200 basis point premium over public loans and bonds. And it earns a five to 600 basis point premium over treasuries. So putting your money into this asset class through time, it really gives you a lot of benefits. But again, long term, it's not the liquid part of your portfolio. It's more the set it and forget it part of your portfolio. So again, when you're sitting down with a potential client, how do you help them navigate what they should be investing in or what product or evergreen they should be invested in? And can you talk about some of the evergreen funds that are on your platform? Yeah, sure. So um you know, we've been advising clients for over 20 years. And one of the things that we learned is that large scale institutional pension funds get so much more a breadth of opportunity to invest in alternatives than the retail investor does. They can use their scale to drive fees down. They can get all sorts of goodies on the size, on the side, like fee free co investments and side cards and very, very low fee SMAs. Whereas retail best investors through time, and that's because they're putting millions and millions, billion, if not yeah, billion, billions, billions, and 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 they're very sophisticated. So they know that they can put these different direct lending managers up against each other to help drive fees down and get the best terms. Retail investors don't have that same level of opportunity, at least not till recently. They historically have been getting forced into less options and more high fee paying options. So like historically, they were really only able to come into like public BDCs, which has very large amounts of volatility. So when we launched our asset manager business in 2019, we wanted to build institutional quality products that were very high quality, where we could drive fees down and get the best deals in the market and put it into a vehicle that was very easy to access for the wealth channel and for the RA channel. And we actually did deep research on this channel and we talked to our RA investors and said, what kind of format would you want direct lending delivered to you? And a lot of the feedback was in the interval fund format because it's very easy to execute. It's ticker execution. It's 1099 reporting. There's no paperwork and it offers that quarterly liquidity so that if you do want to get your money out, you have the opportunity to get your money out every quarter. Um, and so we launched our first product, the Cliff Order Corporate Lending Fund. We just passed our five-year anniversary. Congratulations. Thank you. We're very excited. It is also now the largest interval fund in the world. It's over $23 billion in gross assets. Um, and this is the fund that basically will lend to borrowers within direct lending. So this is the largest 
market segment within private credit. It's a trillion and a half dollar market. We're lending to middle market borrowers and we try to keep the fund very safe. We do first lien lending. It's 95% first lien. We, our motto is keep the position sizes in the fund very, very small because there's always going to be credit losses in direct lending and credit. You can't avoid those. But our whole motto is if we keep position sizes small and we stay senior, our losses will be small. Diversification. Diversification. And this fund pays right now, you know, the assets are generating a 10 to 11% yield. So it's a very nice product for folks that are looking for a very safe, diversified first lien product. It's a nice income generation, even yes. in this environment, yes. even with interest rates that yes. have gone up. That's a yes. very nice income stream. Yes. And then um, three years ago, we launched our second interval fund, which is the Cliffwater Enhanced Lending Fund. That is now the third largest interval fund in the space. It's over $3.3 billion in gross assets. And this is for clients that were looking for a little bit more of an enhanced yield. So they wanted, you know, a two, 300 basis point premium over the first fund. And so how we deliver that for the enhanced lending fund is you really have to find um, less traffic market segments within private credit. So this one doesn't do direct lending. It does the more niche esoteric areas outside of direct lending. So we're looking for complexity premiums. So deals that are maybe a little bit tougher to understand or you need real niche specialty in certain subsectors, or our investment team on this fund is looking for scarcity of capital premium. So looking for areas of the market where maybe a lot of folks have exited the market so you can drive enhanced returns. So they're looking at things like asset-backed lending, venture lending, life sciences, structured capital, legal assets, like very esoteric, small market segments, very customized. And so they'll take a little bit of each asset class and try and find the best managers in the space to do those deals and stick with those top managers in each of those verticals. And then to round out our investment offering, this year we launched our third interval fund, Cascade Private Capital Fund, which is a private equity focused interval fund. This is our private equity fund. This will be the highest returning fund of the three because it mostly focuses on small private equity buyout um, investing and it will do secondaries and it will do some structured capital. Um, but all three of the funds are evergreen. They don't have a finite life. Investors can come into them any day of the week. Um, and they're all great options based on the yield profile that folks are looking for. Well, you sold me. <laughs> I'm, I'm impressed. Patrick, let's, let's just talk about the industry and how the industry is positioned a little bit. Um, so as I said, when I came in the business, okay, that was the 1980s. Um, Alternatives were, as I said, you know, gold commodities, not really private markets. Yeah. On average today, what's the allocation um, in in alternatives, and what's the growth potential? It's a good question. And so, reading some recent research, I've seen uh, family office reports that have said overall in the wealth in the wealth segment that um, alternative investments are approximately five percent of an average portfolio. But even on a deeper dive, when that segment, when the wealth management uh, is segmented further into your ultra high net worth and high net worth family offices, and then below that you have your mass affluent, the, the higher end is more into the, into the high teens, 20s, even 30s. Whereas when you get to the mass affluent and below, it's 1% or below. So you're getting that 5%, but I, I still believe that you're, average mass affluent investor is still woefully um, under allocated. And so it has evolved over time to your point in the initially it was a commodities. We saw different types of commodity investing av available, whether it was hard or futures, the liquid alts managers. And those are, every, you know, some of the liquid alt managers are more like trading strategies. What I really like about the private markets is we've talked about the growth. We've talked about how they are becoming a certain percentage of the overall market. And I think from a market cap weighted perspective, it makes sense to have potentially a pro rata um, allocation on the long only side to these private assets. And so, you know, if a bank decides they're no longer gonna be making a type of loan and a private lender wants to step in to do the same loans, I don't think that most investors should you know, no longer do those anymore. They should find the appropriate risk, particularly if it's going to be yielding, you know, 300 to 500 basis points more than what they're getting. Um, and 
another phenomenon that we're seeing on the public side where I almost don't view these as alternative investments, but um, so much is that we're seeing on the, on the public side the advent of, of a lot of beta ETF investing that you're seeing some dysfunction in the, in the, in the public credit markets. You know, ETFs are buying every bank loan and every high yield bond, no matter what the company is without even underwriting it. And so, you know, I view that that causes some uh, dysfunction in the public markets too, and maybe some spreads that are, that are too tight. And there's more, even more opportunity for better risk adjusted returns in the, in the private markets. Well, based on Fran's comments, there's a lot of more discernment in what, what you're willing to commit to. Um, Let's address the concerns about the private credit market. There, there have been some negative headlines. And the concern is, is that private companies have become banks, right? They've disintermediated the banks. And I, I would argue they filled a void where capital was not available because banks couldn't lend because of all of the regulation. Um, you know, we're capitalists. We're, if, if there's an opportunity, we we find a way to do that. And I think that's what the private markets have done. Can you address maybe some of the concerns or um, try to dispel really some of the concerns that are out there because they've taken on loans and they're not considered regulated? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, and I think there are concerns that that in headlines that um, that private credit funds in the private credit market is not regulated. And I think that one thing I would point to is that is the first statistic is the default rates. So I've seen statistics anywhere from a particular funds having, you know, default rates as low as three basis points. And then even the entire um, private credit market being around 1% ish. And that is lower than what you're seeing on the public markets. And what that points to is not that private companies are um, necessarily healthier than public companies. I think they're all in the same um, you know, macro environment. We're all experiencing the same um, consumers and customers. And what it comes down to is that the private credit lenders potentially might have more reliance on their own internal due diligence and their own underwriting skills that for, if you're good at picking managers, um, you understand that those managers may be underwriting loans better than a bank is underwriting their loans. And so we think that while it is unregulated, we view that by looking at the statistics, you would think that the underwriting standards of the private credit lenders are better than banks. Now that's not true overall, you do have to be um, we have seen higher um, defaults or an uptick in, in defaults in the, in the lower market, the, the lower middle market, as opposed to the middle market and even the upper market to some degree in this current cycle. And so the type of investing you're doing, the size and the sectors that you're in, that you're in um, do make a difference. And um, when it comes to investing in, in terms of a bank making a loan versus a BDC or, or a fund making a loan on the private credit side. I think there's one distinction I want to make is that particularly in the registered funds, the BDCs and the interval funds, they have very tight regulations around how much transparency they have to have. So they're filing 10Ks and 10Qs or annual reports and semi-annual reports and holdings with a lot of regulatory oversight around the amount of leverage they can take and who they can lend to, and as well as where the valuations are and where they're marking everything, um, almost more so than you may have transparency inside of a bank. And also funds are limited for every, for particular, you know, particularly in a BDC, if you invest a dollar in a BDC, they're generally um, investing $2 out. Whereas a bank, if you put a, you know, a dollar into a bank, they sometimes are lending out many times that amount. And we've seen the, that's why regula regulators have come in and limited the amount of leverage that banks could have. Um, but it's certainly the, the, the interval fund, which is, which is even lower leverage in the BDCs have uh, far more regulations on them in a lot of ways. And people really realize. And people realize. 
So, and that's what you specialize in. You you do manager research, you do due diligence, that's your area of expertise. You really have to dive in and know what company you're committing to. But friend, right. let me give you an opportunity to, to respond since you're, you're in you're in that world. Um, is there anything you want to say about some of the negative headlines that have recently been out there? Yeah. <laughs> um, it's a good question. Um, the, me- the media is really going after private debt this year. It's become very obvious. And I have to say, I've been following this asset class for 15 years, direct lending, and I've never seen more media attention on an asset class than I have right now. And they're really looking for headlines that they're going to get a lot of clicks on. And so between 2021 and 2023, it was a great time to be writing about direct lending. It was record m and deal making. The BSL market was shut. The high yield bond market was shut. There was no other game in town. So direct lenders, it was like a dream for direct lenders. They could underwrite massive mega deals. They underwrote over 200 billion of mega deals during that period. So it was a lot of positive stories on direct lending. Fast forward to 2024, and the headlines are just not as interesting. Nobody really wants to write about repricing, and it's not so interesting to write about M&A volume being average. It's not sexy. No, it's not sexy, and it's not going to get clicks. And maybe five years ago, we had four media organizations covering direct lending, and today there's 50. I mean, it's just astronomical how many folks are trying to cover this market segment. But what I'll say is that... um, the space is doing really, really well, and you're going to continue to read these negative headlines. But again, um, if you look at the default stats, really in our CDLI index right now, the default rate's at one and a half percent. So everything is performing fine. If anything, usually the non-accrual rate through the 20-year track record of the CDLI is more like two to two and a half percent. So we're not seeing real concerns about the economy falling off a cliff and these borrowers defaulting in mass and people losing money. The loss rate in the first quarter was around 80 basis points annualized and our long-term average is around 100. So the indicators are looking healthy. So you're gonna continue to see these headlines coming from the media, but again, they're just trying to write about the extremes and there's always gonna be a reason or something that's gonna default or a borrower that maybe takes advantage of a loose stock. But just keep in mind, there's 9,000 obligors in the CDLI index, there's a lot. There's always gonna be some names that are gonna default. So we tell our investors, expect to model in you know 50 to 100 basis points of losses in this asset class a year if you're still the portfolio is still throwing off a 10 to 11 percent yield every year based on where base still rates have are today, a high single digit you still return have a high single digit return and so unless we're going into a three sigma great financial crisis type type environment it's very unlikely that you're going to lose money if you work with good managers that are building large diversified portfolios that are you know lending to defensive borrowers and that are doing deep underwriting and working with top private equity shops. Well, if the private markets are anything like the public markets, I always tell clients when the news is really bad, that's when you're supposed to be buying, right? It's never comfortable to buy on on, on bad news. Fran, you know, we went from zero to five and a quarter um, percent interest rates, meaning the, the Fed funds rate, um, which was one of the fastest rate hikes uh, in, in history. Um, some people are estimating that we may start seeing interest rates come down. What Does the interest rate environment matter for your pocket of the market to invest? How does interest rates drive um, the private credit market? Yeah, it's a, it's a really great question because a lot of the money that's been coming into the asset class has been because it's floating rate. It's a natural hedge for interest rate risk. And direct lending is producing a low double digit return today versus Three or four years ago, it was more high single digit. First lien loans, when base rates were near zero, were throwing off a 7% yield. Today, they're throwing off an 11% yield. So it's a very good question. If base rates fall, what happens to demand for the asset class? My view is that it's really not going to change the demand that much. We're not going to see a mass exit of exodus of investors leaving because rates are falling, because rates are going to fall everywhere. And it is true that we've seen spread tightening in direct lending over the last 12 months. Because the market has become a little bit more competitive, investor sentiment is more bullish, there's been a lot of cash coming in. So we have seen spread tightening by about 100 basis points, but you're seeing spread tightening everywhere. You're seeing it in in the bond market, you're seeing it in the loan market. And so um, we feel that the spread premium that you're getting is still there. 
you're still getting five to 600 basis point premium over treasuries. You're still getting that 200 basis point premium over public loans. So I think what happens is, is everybody's returns are going to start to go down, but direct lending is still going to maintain that enhanced premium. And so I think it's still going to keep investors interested in the asset class. And it's a growing asset class. It's projected to go, what, one and a half trillion up to two and a half, mm-hmm. three trillion, three trillion, three trillion. couple of years. So, yep. Yeah. So, so it's definitely a gr- growing market. Patrick, part of this market has secondaries. So there's a lot of concern that, uh, you know, pension funds, endowments are already at their max weight. They could have 20 to 30 percent. They may be, li- you know, wanting to liquidate part of that holding. What happens to that? But there's a whole underlying secondary market that a lot of people are unaware of. Can you explain the secondary market in the private market space? Uh, absolutely. So the secondary market is, in a lot of ways, like the secondary market in the, in the public market. We have a market of, of buyers that might want to buy loans that exist from a current investor, and it's not nearly as liquid as our as our um, public markets, but it exists. And the dynamics for why someone sells is it depends on on their view or what their current portfolio is. And so you brought up institutions that are um, currently a- active in the secondary market and partially because they are rebalancing their portfolios. and um, Or there might be a new you know, CIO who has come in and decided to position the portfolio in a different way. And the process for them to sell it, unlike in the, in the public markets where... Um, where you can, you know, can't put in a ticker symbol. You can't put in a QCIP on a ticker symbol <laughs> and put it on the bond market. Um, they usually hire a banker and run a process, and then and then try to either sell a uh, a position. But it's usually a porf- a diversified portfolio of current loans or of funds. So it's really interesting because the secondary market has been currently under a lot of. Um, more of a supply demand dynamic where there is a discount on secondaries across all secondary market, but even in private credit. And so investors such as, um, you know, we know Cliffwater does quite a bit of this uh, research and investing, but if they're willing to, and they have a capital, you can buy existing private credit loans. Um, You've been able to underwrite the loans. It's a diversified pool of loans and Sometimes you get discounts too, because you're going out to the secondary market, you have to get a discount. It gets somebody to buy it. Yeah, right? absolutely. And and I'm sure Frank could talk a little bit more what that looks like, but it it offers you know instant diversification, um, interesting yields, interesting pricing from from investors that are simply looking to, you know, rebalance the portfolio and it's so it's not necessarily negative. No. I think sometimes it's spun in a negative way but it's not necessarily negative. Oh, it's a fantastic opportunity. And I think that it requires, it requires when we look at secondary managers that they're careful about deploying capital. For example, if a loan was, um, was underwritten in a zero interest rate environment, you wanna make sure if you're gonna buy that loan that you understand the, the company really well, the covenants, the spread, you know, as Fran mentioned, spreads have changed, they, they were, wider last year they're a little bit tighter this year but three years ago they were they were very tight so you want to understand are you being compensated for the amount of risk you're taking in today's environment do you want to say anything about secondaries yeah i mean i agree with all your points um why we find them attractive to your point of being able to come in at a discount is hugely beneficial particularly in this market because you do need to have deep expertise You need to have a large comps database to be able to underwrite every single one of these loans. You want to make sure that you're coming in at the right price. And what we love about the secondary trade is if we can do our job right, even if there's loans in there that might potentially default, as long as you can calculate kind of what is this mark worth, what is the value of this loan, and you can buy this portfolio at the right price, you can really get a nice pop on your return when these things start to repay. So and right diversification, now, and right? Diversification. It's diversification. But right now we're in a market where um, low prices are coming down in terms of yields are coming down, spreads are coming down. So sometimes some of these older portfolios are really attractive because they might have vintage assets that have higher spreads on them. 
And so if even if you're buying those at a discount and then those loans reprice, you're getting really nice pops on the fact that they're buying them out at par and maybe you came in and bought them at a 97 mark or 96 mark. So um, secondaries is not widely available. It's sometimes very hard to get into these. We at Cliffwater have an edge because we're a very objective third party. We're not competing with a lot of these investors or these managers. We're very friendly. So we have a nice edge in getting into these secondaries, but we that it's a big strategy in all three of our funds. So Fran, I've been hearing about a recession for over a year. Kind of more I, than a year. Yes. So w- we've been so afraid because, as Patrick pointed out, the yield curve I- is inverted for the longest in history. Um, we've had this Fed tightening, and, and most historic models were forecasting a recession. I've always argued it's all the liquidity from the Fed and from the government that's allowed the economy to continue to grow, maintain full employment. But what do you tell clients? Because obviously at some point we'll ha- we will have a recession. What has been your experience when you go through a recession? What is your market like? And how do you prepare clients so they don't panic um, if, if they start seeing default rates, let's say, go up in a recessionary environment? Yeah, it's a really great question. And going in the recession is not fun for any investor. And it's not fun for any asset class. Uh, even for the public <laughs> markets, because generally and the market's all going... Asset all asset classes go down. Yeah. And, and I, I'd have to point back to the index. Um, what What's really important is when you look at the CDLI and we go back 20 years, we've been through recessions. We can look at the data. You're definitely going to see loss rates go higher. But what's really important is just comparing private debt to other asset classes. And let's take 2008 as an example. Private debt has had a positive return in every single year in the 20-year history that we've tracked it, except for 2008, which was a Three Sigma event, the Great Financial Crisis. Very unusual. The market, you know, basically banks were failing left and right. But direct lending was only down 7%. It was a negative 7% year. But if you looked at what happened to equities, they were down over 30%. Bonds were down over 20%. So the point is that you do have downside protection in direct lending. So unless we have some sort of astronomical default cycle, even during COVID, losses spiked to around two, 300 basis points during COVID, but we still produced a positive return in the asset class. It wasn't high single digit. It came down to like the low to mid single digit area. But we try to tell clients you're not going to lose money and fall off a cliff in this asset class because you're protected by the fact that, number one, we're going to work these credits out. We're first lean in the capital structure. So even if loans default, there's a good chance that we're going to recover something. Sometimes a lot of these lenders take the keys from the sponsor and they can even turn some of these bad situations into gains when they sell the company. Now, they have to hold the company for a really long period of time, but if you can invest with managers that are building big, diversified portfolios, two, 300 borrowers in the portfolio, and they're dealing with defensive credit. So one of the lessons learned within direct lending, 10 years ago, direct lenders were doing lower middle market companies, more cyclical companies. Um, it was a lot riskier 10 years ago. Today, everyone's moved up in the capital stack. They're lending to bigger borrowers, and they're lending to companies in more resilient sectors that typically don't cycle as aggressively as if you were lending to a heavy energy company or a metals and mining company. Like, well, if you look at some of the, the deals in the high yield bond market, they tend to be a little bit more cyclical, even though they're higher rated. Some of them are a little bit more cyclical. So we tell clients, you know, trust in the data. The data is there. We can point to the data. And unless we have some astronomical event, and if we have some astronomical event, like we're all in for a world of hurt with regards to any asset class that we're in. But longer term, you get recovery, even in, yes. in, in the um, public markets, yes. if you're patient. And the nice thing about direct lending is there's no forced selling. So if you look at the public bond markets or the loan markets, what happens? All these investors start panicking and they start dumping their assets. And you start to see prices go down, 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 down. And that can really drive your returns down if you're stuck in that situation. Direct lending, we're not selling assets. We're underwriting these loans through the cycle. It's a buy and hold mentality. So you don't see the prices of these assets plummet, not even close to the same correlation that you see. Now, they definitely will move down and get marked down, especially if they're impaired. But you won't see a whole level of portfolio assets getting marked down 
you know, 20 points like you could see in the syndicated loan market or the high yield bond market. And I would add that um, there are several outcomes in the market, of course. There's worries about inflation, which is potentially another, a, a different fear where rates stay higher. And, you know, when on the fixed income side, on the credit side, when every credit asset is should be competing for capital evenly in a recessionary environment, you would want to be at the top of the capital structure, of course. So private credit does well in that environment. But also in an inflationary environment, if we do have high rates, you may think in order to be, you know, uh, to be more conservative, you may take more duration risk or something, IG, longer duration, maybe treasuries, but that can hurt you as well. And private credit has a very short duration. So it offers first lien capital as well as, um, you know, short duration. So it can do well in a variety of environments, which kind of makes it um, a really interesting in terms of competing for where you should all be ca- allocating your dollars. So it really, it really does add diversification to a portfolio if it's appropriate for that client's portfolio. Correct. So Patrick, what are some of the questions you're getting? You're an expert in, in alternative investments. And I know you meet with a lot of managers, you meet with a lot of financial advisors. What are some of the common questions that you've been getting about the space or concerns for that matter? Um, that's a good question. So I saw that on our prep list and I actually wasn't sure what question to go with. On the, Cause there's so many. Or- there's so, yeah, cause I don't know. Like I get, yeah, I, I think we covered a lot of them about, um, you know, the regulatory environment questions around default rates and really like, what is, what is this asset class? And so I think, you know, We've covered quite a bit of that stuff, but I do think that um, that getting advisors to make that first investment in private credit has been the biggest hurdle that I've come across is explaining a lot of things we've discussed already. So Fran, if you can believe this, we're up to our last question. And so my last question to you is, what haven't we talked about? What haven't I asked you that you think is really important for our viewers? Um, So, I mean, I'll leave you with this because the market is in a weird spot. It's, are we going into a recession? Is the economy strong? And I think a lot of people are starting to have hesitation, like, where do I put my money? And what I'll say about direct lending is, it is all weather, and there is no wrong time to come as direct lending. Actually, the right time is now, because we view it as you don't have to worry about timing the market. I I mean, I look at equities and everyone talks about like NVIDIA, that's like the hot topic. And I'm like, do I go in now, Is trade it down? Like, you just don't know because it's very difficult to say like, am I paying too much? Am I paying too little? Or if you're investing in distressed debt, like when is the distressed debt wave coming? Direct lending is not like that. It's an all weather asset class, regardless. And Patrick, you brought this up earlier, regardless of what's going on in the macro, direct lenders can, if they have liquidity, find really good investment opportunities and capitalize on that market. The other thing is that these loans, um, they tend to change the the interest rate very often and they're not as long duration as they look. So a lot of them have like a five to seven year tenor, but most of them repay within three years. So they get recycled very often. And then a lot of times the borrowers come back to the bank group at least one or two times a year to do add on acquisition. So direct lenders are in constant dialogue with the borrowers with the private equity shop, and they're modifying the loans all the time. So if market conditions change, you will see the rate on the loans change. If things become more bullish, like it is this year, we've seen pricing come down. But if we see the market get dislocated, direct lenders have the opportunity to reprice those loans higher to earn those economics. So don't worry about having to time the market, invest in direct lending now, put it on the shelf and forget about it, long-term allocation, compounded annual returns. And then the last piece is, as you see negative headlines, as you see, is there too much cash in the asset class? Is there um, too much money coming in? Is it too aggressive? Just keep in mind that, in my view, this is the most highest quality we've seen direct lending in its history. If we went back 10, 15 years ago, you had new entrants coming in with like five people, a dog in a Bloomberg terminal, like trying to get into direct lending. You can't do that anymore. You had people doing very cyclical investing. They were doing second liens on energy companies. They were doing you know, $5 million EBITDA companies, lower middle market. And, we, you know, and we can see what the track record was. It still did really well, despite more aggressive lending back in the day. Today, we've got folks focusing on 
top of the capital stack, larger companies. If you look at the average EBITDA on people's portfolios, they're continuing to move up because they're taking market share away from the institutional loan market. We're lending to bigger borrowers, better borrowers, more resilient borrowers, brand names that you see every day when you go out to the mall or where you go outside of your house. Um, and so don't be worried about the headlines, long-term compounded annual returns, and you'll be happy that you did it. This has been a phenomenal discussion. I've really enjoyed this so much. Fran, thank you so much. And thank you for letting us use your headquarters in New York City with Bill McCare in New York City. Thank you for coming. And Patrick, thank you for joining. Thank you. Thanks, Mayor. And I want to thank all of you for tuning in as well. Thank you for watching or listening to the Friends of Sanctuary podcast. Tune in next month to be sure not to miss out on the next installment of the series. Sanctuary Wealth consists of the wholly owned subsidiaries, True Independence and Sanctuary Advisors, LLC, SEC Registered Investment Advisors, Sanctuary Securities, Inc., a FINRA member broker-dealer, as well as Sanctuary Alternative Holdings, Sanctuary Asset Management, Sanctuary Insurance Solutions, Sanctuary Global, and Sanctuary Global Family Office.